flighty, promiscuous, self-centered, impatient, disloyal, vulgar, violent, techno-crazy. I, I think you know who I'm talking about. These are the kind of epithets that are being flung at the rising generation of young Australians. Of course, for thousands of years, it's been fashionable to put the boot into young people. But I don't think we've seen, uh, certainly not for a long time, such an intergenerational hostility as we're seeing at the moment. What's driving this? What is it about this rising generation that so annoys uh, their parents, some of their teachers and many of their potential employers? Partly, of course, it's the same as it always is. We always envy young people because we know they've got the whole future ahead of them and a lot of our lives have already passed. But there's more going on than that. In order to understand all of that, it seems to me we have to understand a bit more about this generation. And no generation is mysterious. All you really have to look at are the formative influences in the first couple of decades of their lives to see how they're likely to have been shaped and what sort of people they're going to turn into. Of course, the proviso has to be made that all generalizations are a bit glib and a bit dangerous. You can't say, because you're a member of this generation, you're like that. But you can say, if you were born in the last 20 years in Australia, there are certain things we know about the influences on you. For example, we know that you're one of the offspring of the most divorced ever generation of Australian parents. We know that more than most previous generations your age, uh, you've experienced the trauma of separation and divorce. Uh, more of you have lived in single parent families than at any time in Australia's history. As a result of that, you're probably a more tribal generation than we've been used to in the past because in this generation of adolescents and young adults, uh, people are forming their own surrogate extended families to compensate for the fact that their own extended families are so often dislocated or in some disarray. The fact that this generation of young Australians is becoming so tribal, uh, while we can see there may have been dark influences driving this, is actually very good news. It does suggest that this is a generation that's going to be rather more cooperative, rather more collaborative, rather less competitive and individualistic than previous generations. It's the tribalism of this rising generation that also explains why they're so enthusiastic about the new information technology that allows them uh, to be in touch with each other almost continuously. They're part of this constantly vibrating web of connectedness that's been created courtesy of the internet. Now, that's got issues as well, of course. It's a generation for whom traditional concepts like privacy and even identity are being blurred and challenged. If you look at the education and upbringing of this generation, there are certain conclusions you could easily draw. They're likely to be far more assertive. They're likely to be more outspoken. They're likely to have grown up with the idea that their opinion is as good as anyone else's. They've had a generation of parents and teachers uh, who've been seduced by the blandishments of the self-esteem movement, uh, a generation who've perhaps been taught that happiness is their default position and that they're all wonderful, they're not allowed to fail, they get rewarded uh, and praised at every turn by parents and teachers who haven't understood uh, that often rewards can turn out to be rather self-defeating in their effects. It's a generation that's grown up in a more complex moral landscape than most previous generations. If you look at everything from their relationships to their sexual behaviour to the fact that they've grown up in a society awash with illicit drugs, uh, they've had to come to terms with the war on terror, uh, which has raised many moral questions still unresolved. 
Uh, they've been living with the reality of climate change and the moral consequences of that. Even some of the moral questions coming to us from the frontiers of biotechnology. This is all part of the world in which they've grown up. Too many moral questions for young people whose moral frameworks and compasses are not yet fully established. They're heavily criticised, for example, for their drug abuse and even for their binge drinking, yet we're the people, of course, who gave them the most liberal drinking laws in Australia's history and then wondered uh, why, they, uh, why they abused them. Uh, even when it comes to money, this is a generation that's grown up with the idea that credit is different from debt. Uh, they've got a generation of parents who taught them that. And they've got a system that teaches them that if you go to university, you will enter the workforce already in debt. Now, what does all this, I've, I've just touched on a few of the influences on this generation, but what does all this do to them? We're, we're talking about a generation that's been living through a period that's often caricatured, but it's, it's fair to say, a period of rapid and accelerating and relentless social and cultural and economic and technological change. And of course, that all does something to the kids who are children and adolescents uh, during such a period of kaleidoscopic change. The main thing it does to them, of course, and we can see it in this generation, is it teaches them to keep their options open. This is a generation criticised for postponing commitment, yet isn't there a tendency to postpone commitment, whether to marriage or parenthood or a career or a mortgage as they move through their 20s and into their 30s? Isn't that a completely rational response to the kind of world uh, we've bequeathed them. Uh, I've already suggested that they're an intensely tribal generation in response to the kind of world they've grown up in, particularly the familial world they've grown up in. Uh, it seems to me that this is a generation who almost intuitively have decided that their most precious resource for coping with life in an unpredictable world is each other and they're embracing each other. This is the generation who all hug each other. You'll have noticed that. Uh, not just the girls with the girls or the girls with the boys, but the boys with the boys as well. And the other thing I think they've learned from growing up at a time like this is to question values, to think more about what kind of life they want, to hear their parents talking about the need for a balanced life and to say, actually, that's quite a good idea, but my father doesn't lead the balanced life he talks about. He's on a treadmill. My mother doesn't lead the balanced life she talks about. She's trying to have it all at once. I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be like her. I actually want to have the kind of life that they've suggested would be more sane uh, and more balanced. So no wonder there's a bit of hostility being directed to this gender. What do they mean? by taking our advice seriously and showing every sign of living the way we've recommended uh, that we should all live, even if we're not doing it ourselves. Uh, of course, not all of them are coping. There is a problem of depression in this generation. There is a problem, though fortunately declining, of youth suicide in our society. But the one thing you could say about this generation is that they are perhaps better equipped than any previous generation of young Australians to cope with uncertainty. And uncertainty is what we're all having to cope, cope with. Personally, I can't wait to see how they'll reshape our world.